All right, it is nine o'clock. Let's get started. Good morning. Glad you're all here. Uh, I'm Martin Pauly. This is my first time at Sun and Fun. I've been uh, a pilot for over 30 years. Started in Germany where I grew up flying gliders. I was a glider instructor there for a few years uh, before coming to the US. Um, I have a private pilot certificate, uh, single engine land, instrument rating, and there are um, some, uh, some links to YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter, but the, you're here, so you probably have these already. I'm gonna talk about a, a, a bunch of different topics, just some tips and tricks that I picked up over the year that I think could be helpful for other people that wanna record their flights and, and turn them into videos. So you'll, you see the topics listed here, we'll talk about each of them. But the one to start with, and, and maybe an interesting question that I get from time to time is, uh, why do I make these videos? You know, what, what got me started with that? And, and uh, what keeps me going? And you, you, you might think you know some reasons. Um, YouTube has an analytics page with a lot of interesting data on who views your videos and, uh, and uh, uh, what time of day, from what countries and so on. So if you think it's a good way to make money, uh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the typical ones and this is the revenue over one year of what, what, uh, what they pay me. So it, it doesn't even come close to paying for, for all the gear that I use. Is it a good way to meet women? <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> So why, why make them? And there, there are a number of reasons that I can think of that, that apply to me. And the first two are kind of connected, learning and teaching, right? Learning and teaching, the, the two people, one on each side of, of the game. Um, I found that I, I learn a lot from reviewing my flights as I edit the videos. And I haven't had a flight yet where I didn't find out later in reviewing the flight that you know, there was something where um, I, I did something or said something on the radio that, that wasn't quite right, that I should have done better. And it would have never occurred to me if I didn't have the chance to, to see it again later. Um, also related to these two, the way I, I started making flying videos was about five years ago, my first flight into Chicago O'Hare. It had been a, a dream of mine to fly into that busy airport uh, not too far from my home in Iowa. And I did a Google search trying to find any information I could get my hands on to tell me what to anticipate when a small single engine piston airplane goes into such a big airport. And I didn't find very much. I, uh, so the friend of mine that came along for the ride had a GoPro camera and he said, well, how about we bring the GoPro and um, record the flight and then maybe it'll be useful for others that, that want to do the same thing. So that's the learning and teaching part. Connecting with other pilots, um, it's, it's a great way to uh, meet other pilots like all of you here today, right? It's uh, 70 Tango Bravo, the tail sign's pretty well known. So when people see me on, on the ramp, you know, often somebody will stop by and start a conversation and I, I just love meeting other pilots and talking about airplanes like we probably all do. The next item is a way to share what we love with, with other people, especially with younger people. You know, the, the 10 year old kids these days, like it or not, they are less likely to ride their bicycles to the airport and, uh, and get into flying. They're probably on their portable devices or, or computers watching YouTube, right? So if we want to plant a seat uh, for the next generation of pilots and get them interested in flying, this is probably one way of doing that. And then for the geek in me, it's a really nice way to, to uh, play with some nice camera gear and electronics gear. What we need, well we need a camera, we need to think about sound and audio, a computer and some editing software. Uh, and we'll talk about each of these, but most of all, we need time. You can make videos on flying or probably pretty much anything uh, on the cheap with all of these here, but uh, it does take a lot of time to review footage, to uh, edit it down to a reasonable size, 
and to deal with the learning curve that the editing software and, and, and the devices themselves have. So um, time's going to be pretty important. So uh, let's talk about each, each of these. The, the cameras, it's amazing how cheap they've gotten, how good they've gotten in, in the small, tiny format. Um, in fact, I would say they're, they're so good that if you want to get started, try it and without breaking the bank, don't even buy a, a new model. Find something older, uh, maybe on eBay a used one, uh, that will do really well. Um, I have experimented with 4K resolution. Um, personally, I don't believe the sensors in the tiny little cameras are, are quite good enough to do a 4K justice. And we're dealing with vibration in our piston airplanes, right, that, that pretty much uh, negates all the advantages of, of 4K anyway. So get a, get a cheaper camera, it'll work just fine. You need to get a memory card, um, and they're becoming cheaper and cheaper all the time. They come in different capacities and different speeds. You know, capacity is pretty simple. The more capacity they have, the longer you can record. And uh, speed, uh, if you go to your electronic store, they'll probably try to talk you into the, the highest speed card. And you don't need that for recording. Where, where the memory speed becomes important is for later copying the files onto your computer. My, with my typical setup from a long flight, uh, if I have four or five cameras going, copying all that can be a pretty lengthy uh, operation. So that's where, for me, the real value of the, of the faster cards is. But uh, again, you can get something cheaper and, and slower if you are a little more patient with the downloading. Then single or multiple cameras, how, how many do you need? You can make a, a video with one, but of course having multiple cameras pointing at different uh, directions is a really nice way to make the final video more interesting um, and uh, to cut seamlessly. You know, if, if I only have one angle and I, I skip a few minutes of the flight, there's gonna be a pretty harsh cut that looks unnatural. But if I do that, you know, going from the say the front view to the right view, nobody will know if there's a minute or, or five minutes missing in between. So that's where multiple angles help and provide a lot of flexibility. We also need to attach these cameras somehow. Um, one hard rule that I have for, for my recordings is uh, when, when I start taxiing, everything needs to be on and, and in place and then I become a pilot and not a camera operator, right? It deserves our full attention. So the mounts are, are pretty important. They need to be stable and not fall off during a takeoff roll uh, or at, at other times. Um, and I found that the suction cup mounts work pretty well. I uh, usually have one uh, on the windshield up, up high pointing forward and then one right and left and another one also on the windshield pointing at me all with these suction cups. For outside mounting, there is another mount. I, I have it and I like it a lot. It's very rugged, doesn't require any tools uh, to install it. So uh, my interpretation is from the regulatory perspective, it's, it's legal to, uh, to operate it. Um, and that's the MyPilot Pro mount, which you can see it here. That's a picture of that camera on the uh, tie-down hook on the tail of my Bonanza. And that works really well for angles either forward, uh, showing the landing gear go up and down. Uh, but my favorite angle actually is pointing backwards so that when you depart from an airport, uh, you have a nice shot of the runway disappearing behind you. And uh, that, that looks pretty nice. All right, next we need to think about audio. The golden rule for filmmaking and, and, and video making is you, Viewers are pretty forgiving when it comes to picture quality. The picture can be shaky, grainy, uh, low resolution, and it's okay. Our, our, our eyes and our brain can compensate for that pretty well and, and tolerate quite a bit of, of uh, badness, if you will. But audio is different. Uh, if, if it's noisy, if it's scratchy, if there's uh, clipping in the audio, that will drive people away. So. I, um, I try to pay a lot of attention also to the audio of the recording that I make 
and then how it sounds in the final product during editing. And to do that, I think it's helpful to think, even before I go up for a flight, what the audio, what the audio in the final product should be like. And I can think of four different components for that. Uh, background music, um, engine noise, like the, the ambient noise uh, that we have in, in the cockpit, a recording of what's being said on the radio and intercom, or a voiceover where after the flight I, I narrate to, uh, to help people understand what's going on. So let's look at what it takes for, for each of those. Background music is probably the easiest during recording, right? We, we don't need anything for, for audio recording. Um, so that's, that's a no-brainer. Engine noise, don't think about a, a high-end microphone or anything like this. I've tried that once, it makes no difference. The uh, little GoPro cameras are actually pretty good at recording noise. Um, and uh, for, for engine noise, it, it works just fine. Um, gets more difficult with the radio and intercom. There are some accessories that you can get from companies like, like Sporty's cables that plug into the headset uh, jack in your plane and then connect to a GoPro camera or similar. And they feed that audio uh, much more, much, much cleaner than, than it could otherwise be recorded into the camera. And it is um, synchronized with the video and, and a very easy solution um, to do. I do something a little different for even better results. I have a uh, very inexpensive digital video recorder and there are multiple brands uh, that, that do the same job that I connect to uh, the headset jack with, with a cable like this, with one large plug and one small plug. And uh, the only other thing I do to help is I have an inline attenuator somewhere in that line because the headphone output is, is pretty high powered and um, makes it easier for the recorder to get a good recording if I limit, if I attenuate that, that signal a little bit. So that, that gives me an uncompressed recording uh, of very, very high quality that gives me all sorts of options for cleaning it up and editing it later uh, for audio processing as I edit the video. For voiceovers, there are different options. There are very cheap microphones with a USB connector that you can connect to your computer and you just write a script and, and read the script and it's really that easy. Um, the only thing I do in addition to that is I have one of these little uh, gadgets here. Um, it's not quite a sound booth. You know, ideally the, that really dry radio voice with no reverb, no echo at all would come from a room that has this kind of, of cone-shaped padding on all the sides to absorb all the, the sound and, and not have any echo come back to the microphones. This is kind of the poor man's version of this. So I have the, this, um, this wall behind the microphone, the microphone and, and a pop filter to eliminate some of the, the harsh noises. And uh, all of this can be had for very little money, cheaper than one of these GoPro cameras. So pretty, pretty easy to do. When we use music, background music, one thing we got to consider is the copyright of the music because uh, pretty much all of the popular music has copyright and while these files now in our digital world are pretty easy to get into the video editor, um, I, I just take it from my music library and literally drag it across the screen to my video editor and there it is. Uh, there could be some legal issues from, from doing that. Um, if you make a video just for yourself that you want to share with family and friends, but not in a public way, there, uh, there should be no issue with, with doing that. However, if you want to make your video available publicly to the world, then copyright is something that needs to be considered. And um, how that works differs from depending on, on what sharing service you use. YouTube actually does a pretty neat job there. They have, um, they have upload filters that look at any new video that's uploaded and they have gotten really, really good at recognizing songs 
that, uh, that are used, even, even short segments of a song. And when they find that, um, they don't block your video. What they do is they create uh, advertising when somebody plays your video at the beginning and use that to pay the artist or artists of the music that you're using. And that works behind the scenes. You don't have to do anything for it. There are very few exceptions of uh, artists that uh, do not allow their music to be used for that. And YouTube will tell you that, and then you can try again without that song, with a different song. Uh, there are a few countries in the world where um, the, the video will not be able to play, but, but for the most part, this is a pretty neat way to handle it. So no need to be afraid to, to use music like that if, if you want to. Other sharing sites don't have that mechanism. So if you go to, to Vimeo or uh, other sites, you're on your own when it comes to copyright and managing that. And um, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer. I've tried to research what it would take to uh, license a, a popular song. And all I, all I understand, it's a very complicated topic. There are uh, law firms that specialize in it, and this is not going to be something that can be done easily or, or cheaply. So um, I would recommend just letting YouTube do that work or go to something called royalty-free music because many of us make, make videos or there are filmmakers that make low-budget uh, productions that cannot afford to, to uh, to license something uh, really popular. Uh, there's a growing market for music that can be used for all sorts of purposes, for, for videos, for, for computer games, for, uh, yeah, there's really no limitation as to what, what you could do with it. And uh, they offer a completely different set of songs, kind of a parallel musical world to the copyrighted music. They have some songs that sound somewhat similar to uh, popular songs. They're called sound-alikes. They're just different enough that uh, you know, legally they, uh, they, they don't violate the copyright. But if you want to uh, create the same environment, the same uh, trigger, the, the same thoughts or emotions as with a popular song, you might be able to find something that sounds similar. If you, if you do a Google search for royalty-free music, you'll find a large number of websites and services that offer that. Uh, some of them cost a little money. Uh, others are free. And some of the free ones require attribution. That just means that in your description of the video, you give credit to wh whoever created the, the music. But then you can use it free of charge um, without any payments to them. A, um, an example of that, that um, I think is fairly new. I, I saw it for the first time about a year ago, is the uh, YouTube audio library, where, uh, again, if you go to YouTube and search YouTube audio library, you will find a screen like this, where uh, there are songs offered for, for download. You, you can play them from here. You can uh, filter by genre, by mood, by what instrument is used, and, and a bunch of other things. Uh, YouTube recognizes that in order for them to be successful, you know, we need to be able to create nice videos with good music. So they offer this completely free so that uh, we have a nice variety of music to pick from for our videos. All right, going from audio back to video, the next thing I'd like to talk about is these nasty propeller artifacts, right? And it's not just video, even with a still camera, if you point your, your iPhone or, or a smartphone or pretty much any camera out the window and, and press the shutter, um, this is what you get. And it doesn't look very nice, doesn't look natural at all, and doesn't even look like a propeller. And to see what we can do about it, I think it's important that we understand what creates this effect. So we'll uh, spend a couple of minutes on that and then we'll, we'll see how we can minimize or eliminate it. What you see here is a, a model of the image sensor inside most cameras, smartphones, GoPros, Garmin, they, they all use very similar technology. 
And this line that's moving up here, in some cameras it's moving up and down, and others it could be right to left, um, that's called a, a scan line. The image for each frame that the camera takes 30 or 60 times a second, right? This, this happens much, much faster in the camera, of course. It's not all captured at the same time, but to make it more manageable for, for processing, um, to handle all the data for the image, there's this scan line moving that, um, that triggers when each line of pixels is, is being queried and, and the data for that line of pixels is stored. So when I if, say this line here, now the shutter would open and then whatever exposure time I have, right, determines how long that line of, of pixels is being exposed to light. But this triggers the opening of the shutter, if you will, for a line of pixels. And it means that one side of the image captures a different moment in time than the other, even though it's the same frame. Right? That, that's the important part. And when we put an object in front of the camera, like a propeller, and you can see that the changing color suggests or, or, or shows what is actually recorded on your memory card for this frame, a still object, a propeller that's not moving, looks perfectly fine. Now if I start moving this propeller, and I slowed it down by about the same ratio as the scan line, you can see what's being captured. And that looks a lot like the picture we saw earlier on the video, right? So that's, that's called uh, rolling shutter, the, the shutter that, that's rolling through the whole image over time, and it creates this effect. Before we talk about the solution to this problem, there is a related effect that's also uh, happening from rolling shutter. And that's jello or wa a wave effect. Some, some videos you may have seen that once you know what to look for, you can't unsee it and you see it in, in many, many uh, different videos. Um, when our camera is mounted and it's not absolutely stable, say it's, it's vibrating ever so slightly because you know, piston airplanes typically are, are not perfectly smooth. Moving the scan line over time through this image while the camera shakes a little bit has an effect that creates this kind of di distortion, right? And, and it changes over time and it looks like some, some kind of wave as, as if you, uh, you know, threw a, a little rock into a, a, a pond and used it as a mirror to, to uh, take a picture of something. And it, it looks very unnatural. Um, a little bit of it is tolerable for most people, but depending on, on where your camera is mounted, how much vibration it is exposed to, it could be a lot. And it's related to the propeller artifact, as we'll see in a moment. So what do we do? Well, we could buy a twin, right? And that would get rid of the propeller artifacts. <laughs> but uh, there's actually a much cheaper solution available. And uh, it's, it's this little thing here. It's uh, like the lens of a sunglass. It's called a neutral density filter. Uh, if you're into photography, you know there are all sorts of filters, polarizing filters. Uh, uh, you can change the color uh, of, of the image with a filter. This is, is neutral. It, it does not affect the color at all, uh, but it does reduce the amount of light that goes through it. So when we put this onto the GoPro, this, this is what it looks like installed. It barely makes it larger. Um, what happens is the camera now senses that it's gotten darker. And if you've done recordings with your uh, camera, even still cameras, at different times of day or under, under a cloudy sky versus a bright sky, you probably notice that this propeller artifact is the worst on a really bright day. And if you fly at night or you know, just after sunset, you can barely see it. The, the reason for that is that if you think of, of that scan line again, which triggers the opening of the shutter, the shutter now stays open for a longer time for each line of pixels, a longer exposure time to get enough light 
onto the image sensor to get a, get a nice looking image. And during that longer exposure time, the propeller turns a lot more than it does on a bright day. So instead of getting a, a sharp snapshot of where the propeller is at that you know, one thousandth of a second, uh, we capture with the camera more the blur of the moving propeller. And it looks a lot more natural. It looks more like how we see it with, with our own eyes when, when we look at it. The, the blur of the propeller disc, there's still some movement visible, uh, but, but not the propeller as if it were just standing still or you know, with this strange geometry. So uh, it, it re looks a bit like, like that here. And that's a lot, a lot more pleasant to look at. Yeah, so here, here you see a video. The, the projector, unfortunately, doesn't have very high resolution. Um, but I, uh, I hope it's, it's visible. This is the same flight, same time, two cameras mounted on the windshield, one with an ND filter uh, on the right and one without a filter on the left. And you can see how the propeller is uh, pretty much invisible on the right. Now, if you look closely, you can see something else. And that is the objects on the left here on this beautiful, bitterly cold Iowa day with lots of snow. Is, it's a lot sharper than on the right, right? The, the picture on the right looks kind of dull, kind of blurry. And that comes, again, from the vibration of the camera. If, um, if I take that same image from before and, and add a little vibration and capture that over time, it, it looks like that. So it's, it's different from Jell-O but they're all related to the rolling shutter and the vibration of, of the camera. And the solution, the solution to that, to avoiding the jello and the blur, is to stabilize the camera, to find the, the best possible mounting position where the camera is not exposed to uh, vibration. And it's, it can be surprisingly easy in, in airplanes um, if you operate with a suction cup mount. Um, on your next flight, as an experiment, just use your hand and touch different points on the window and feel how much vibration you get at each point. And you may be surprised that just moving by a couple of inches can get you from something that shakes a lot to something that is perfectly uh, perfectly stable, no, no shaking, no vibration. And that's the point where you want to put the suction cup for a more stable position. And that helps with um, blur and it helps with vibration. Yet another thing you can do is, um, you know, there are all these accessories to build a longer or shorter arm for, uh, for the cameras. Um, Intuitively, you would think that a shorter arm is better for vibration because it limits how far the camera can move, and in many cases that's true. But I've uh, just by, by luck found that um, sometimes adding a, a couple of, of joints to this, uh, to this arm for mounting seems to just dampen out the vibration just enough to put the camera into a more stable position, so it can also help. A uh, different solution to the same problem is a mount for the camera that has some, some dampener in it. An example is uh, Vibex. I don't, I don't have one yet, but it's something that uh, an airshow photographer uh, recommended to me, though I may give that a try sometime in the future. I actually found their, their booth here at, at the show. They're in Hangar D next to the aviation YouTubers, if you want to give them a look. They, they mount their mounts on, on hard points. So you have to find a, a screw, like an interior screw, take it out, put the mount point in and the screw back in, and then you can mount all the accessories on there. So that is something that might, I might give a try in the future. All right, it feels like we have the air conditioning going in the room now, so that's nice, but uh, my airplane doesn't have air conditioning and uh, yours may or may not. One thing that these cameras cannot tolerate very well is heat. They, they get warm just from running the electronics on the inside. And when they get, they get warm also because they're often exposed to sunlight, right? The one I have uh, under the windshield, if the sun is shining, it gets pretty warm there. 
and it can get so warm that they shut off. You know, there's a temperature sensor in the camera. They can only handle so much heat. At, at some point, they will, they will turn off. A couple of, couple of things that I've found that, that help with that is I have cooling vents over, over my head. And if I open them and then use the sun visor to direct that cool air to the windshield, it, it puts the camera into a nice flow of, of cool air during the flight. That, that helps tremendously. Um, another really cheap way to do that is use a piece of scrap paper, build like a sunshade for it. You put it over the mount in, in somewhere so that the sensor doesn't, doesn't get blocked, of course. But uh, this, if, if you don't have a vent that you can use, this will keep the camera cool enough to run for hours. That works really well. One thing that these cameras are not so good at is battery life. You know, they have, uh, with, with the large capacity memory cards, recording capacity for, for many hours, you know, five hours or more. But the, the battery, you know, on a good day probably lasts two, um, sometimes less. So for longer flights, um, battery life is a concern. You remember I, I said that I want to have all my cameras set up and not even think about them anymore uh, before I leave the hangar. Uh, so I need to make sure that they have power for the duration of the flight. Fortunately, uh, the GoPros, and I, I, I suspect other models too. I only have GoPros, so I, I can't tell you with certainty what other models do. Fortunately, they um, can record and charge at the same time. So you can plug a USB cable in and put it into uh, a, a power port, like on a cigarette lighter adapter or one of these battery packs that, uh, that are becoming so popular. And that solves all the power issues. It creates a little more clutter in the cockpit with the cables. Um, I wish there was a way around that, but uh, there, there isn't. So that's, that's how um, that works. And if, if you only have one outlet for USB, you can cycle it between different cameras if you have multiple cameras, right? You give, give each camera a 10 minute boost of power that will get it going for another half hour and then cycle around until everything is charged. Question I get fairly frequently is how do I record the screen on my iPad? If you've seen uh, some of my videos, especially the ones where I go into the larger airports, I uh, have the EFB application that I run on my iPad screen in my videos and it's not a camera pointed at my iPad, but it's a, it's a recording, a digital recording of the screen. The iPad, at least in the newer versions of iOS, has a screen recording function built in that sort of works for maybe a couple of minutes or you know, shorter times, but uh, from my experience and from the experience of many other people, it's not reliable for uh, recording an entire flight. It creates enormous amounts of data. It slows down the applications. It might just stop at some point because it's, um, it's not um, all that reliable. So what I do instead is I use an external video recorder, digital video recorder that has an HDMI input. And then this little adapter here that Apple makes, it has a lightning port on one side that plugs into your uh, your iPad and an HDMI on the other end. And without any processing or storage burden on the iPad itself, it provides a, a very reliable and, and super clean recording of whatever I see on the iPad synchronized with all the other cameras. So I, I just use that in my editing software as another track of, um, of what I recorded. It's, it's not cheap, this recorder was about $500. But if it is something you want to do, I, I cannot think of a, of a better solution to capture what's going on on the EFB. Who makes that? The one I have is from a company called Blackmagic. One, one really new thing is um, this, this uh, virtual reality, a 360-degree camera. They're becoming popular. They've reached a, a price point where 
Uh, many people uh, can afford them. They're not that much more expensive uh, these days than the regular GoPro cameras. In fact, I have one here. I can show you what it looks like. So this is it from, from one side, but when I turn it around, there's a lens on the other side as well. So these are both fisheye lenses. They, they cover a little over 180 degrees all around. And the camera stitches these two, the images from these two lenses together to record everything going around me at any given time. It's a, uh, it's, it's a fairly new concept that people are experimenting with and it, it feels kind of strange walking around with the camera without pointing it. Right, a normal camera you, you point, but here there's no pointing because you record everything at any time. And you can use that to turn it into a video at the end that looks normal, where in editing you point, right? So um, uh, I was using that here at the air show you know, with things going on all around, you know, looking at, uh, at the military transport when on the other side behind me there was uh, aerobatics going on. So I, I can turn that into two videos later for just one recording. Or uh, different yet, I can leave it in this virtual reality format and then you, the viewer, uh, on your portable device or on your computer with a mouse or with the, with, the VR, with the VR goggles, you can turn around and decide what you want to look at at any moment in time. So that's uh, still very new. You did that I, I did one video, yes, that was uh, coming out of Kansas City. That was the first time I, I played with it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm still in the very early stages of experimenting with it. I'm, I'm not entirely sure yet what the best application for it is, but I, I will do some more. And I, I did capture a lot of footage here with it at, uh, at Sun and Fun, and we'll, we'll just see what, what happens. It's, um, it seems like it's still very poor quality. The quality of 360 cams so far are not quite there yet. Yes, yes, that's, that's right. There, the, the two downsides, I would say, is one is the data volumes that are created are humongous and hard to deal uh, with in terms of storage and processing and the resolution of what you look at. Right? You, you, have a, you have a lot of pixels in this camera, but you only look at a few of those, a small fraction at any given time. So the picture clarity, yeah, you're, you're right, is not, not there yet. And I would expect that over time we'll see the resolution go way up for these uh, VR cameras to get to something equivalent of HD at least. Are there mounting options for the 360 camera? Uh, mounting options for the 360 camera? So this one has a, a standard uh, thread for uh, a tripod or a, a selfie stick and I, I've used that before um, so I could put it on something like this and just set it on the table. I've had it in a, in a, on a small tripod that I put in the right seat on my airplane. So the, the resulting view was the, the co-pilot's view, right? You could turn your head left and see me. You could turn your head right and look out the wing. Um, I've also heard people that have a mount point like this on the, on the ceiling, on the, by the headliner of the plane, and they just attach it there. Um, so lot, lots of options. I, I'm not sure this is something I would want to mount externally. Uh, it might be nice, but given, given that uh, the mount point is, is here, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that uh, with, with the long arm here all the way down, it might just break and come off. It's a very nice camera, but uh, I'm not sure how rugged the, the mount is. A couple of other things. Once we have the video recorded, we need to edit it. Right? And, and we could spend a, a whole week in a classroom teaching editing and editing software. Um, that's something that has a pretty steep learning curve for the, the more advanced software, but not necessarily a, a steep price point. There is free software available that does a pretty nice job with the editing. If you, you run Windows, there used to be a program called Windows Movie Maker. Now they call it uh, Microsoft Photos. Uh, so that's worth a shot. If you have Apple, there's iMovie that comes with every Apple computer to start 
uh, putting your, your footage together and uh, cutting it to the final product. And if you're looking for something more capable than, than these uh, fairly simple editors, there's a, there are multiple free software packages that do that. And uh, one that I think sticks out is called DaVinci Resolve that does the screenshots here on the right, it does uh, multiple audio tracks, multiple video tracks, uh, effects, color grading, um, all of that completely free of charge. The only thing you need to invest is time to learn how to use it. But uh, even for that, there are lots of tutorial videos on, on YouTube and, and other services available. And once your video is done, you want to share it with friends and family or maybe the entire world. Well, how do you do that? Even if you don't want your video to be public, even if you only want to show it with a few people, uh, YouTube is probably a good choice for that. It's, uh, of, of all the sharing sites it's, um, that I've seen, it's the, the easiest to use. It does a really good job recognizing different file formats, working with different resolutions, and, uh, and converting it to something that it, it can use. Um, and there are different, yeah, question? I'm just curious, do you know when you put something up on YouTube, do they protect your rights also, or is it now pretty much public? Um, you decide who can view your videos on, on YouTube. So there are three levels, public, unlisted, and private. Public, then anyone can see it. It's still your video, right? Yeah. You, you don't lose the, the copyright of what you created. But, uh, but it's, it's available for everyone to see and to search for the title and so on. Unlisted is one where um, YouTube will not make the video just available to, to random people. You cannot search for it. But if you have the URL, the, the web address of that video that you can send to, to friends and family in an email, Anyone with that web address can see the video. And then finally, there's private, which means that you determine that you know, the following people can see my video and nobody else. That's the, the, the most protected way. Unfortunately, that requires that each of the viewers that you specify have a YouTube account. You know, that's how you tell YouTube who, who can see them. So from a practical perspective, I think public is, is an easy option and unlisted is an easy option. Um, it still keeps the distribution pretty, pretty small because people are not likely to have that link, to have that URL, unless they know you and unless they got that URL from you. But uh, the, the rights to the video remain yours. YouTube doesn't, doesn't take that from you. And, and uh, I mentioned YouTube accounts. I, I, it's probably uh, understandable that to upload videos, you need to create an account just register with an email address and, and a password, and then uh, that gives you access to the upload section. All right, that is the material I had prepared for today. We have five minutes left for questions if, if you have any, but I'm glad you came out this morning and hope uh, learned something from it. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you make up with reflection off of the windscreen and the uh, aircraft? Um, reflection of, of uh, the windshield in the aircraft. I find that what helps is to wear dark clothes. So if I wear a, a bright white shirt, I will see my reflection. If I wear something dark, I will not see that. My, uh, my glare shield is already painted black. Uh, another thing to avoid is to place a, a piece of paper or a checklist on the glare shield. So do you, I, I don't think it's possible to, to, to stop the reflection, but if you're careful about what you put there that could be reflected, you should not have a problem. That, that's my experience. Yes? How do you sync up your cameras? Do you start all them all at once, or do you connect them to your phone and fire them up all at once? How do you sync all different cameras? Uh, the, yeah, syncing of the cameras takes a little work. Uh, they all operate at the same frame rate, you know, 30 frames per second or 29.97 frames per second, um, along with the audio recorder. Um, but they drift 
a little bit in time. So when I import the footage from the different cameras into the editing software, I, I need to find, well, start, start with, with, the, with the point where they all align, like when I, when I start the engine, you know, when the prop starts moving or the, the loud gets noise, that's an easy way to uh, align the footage. But I need to do that not just once, I need to do it multiple times because they, they drift away from each other ever so slowly. And uh, on some angles that's less noticeable, you know, like right or left. But uh, for example, the camera that shows me and the audio recorder when they drift and the, the, the lip syncing is, is gone, that requires a, a few adjustments. Now, so, do you just do that in the editing software or is there anything else that you can do? For example, uh, my audio and my cameras don't sync up. I can sync it up at the beginning, but by the end it's completely out of sync. Is there, other than editing, is there any other way to kind of fix that or convert it in some way? What, what camera and what audio gear do you use? So I, I have GoPro cameras mm -hmm. and a Sony recorder. Okay. They shouldn't drift that much. I mean, maybe a fraction of a second for, per hour, but if, if it's more then I suspect there's something not quite right with the setup. Maybe, maybe the, the, hmm, what could that be? So to, to answer your question, I, I do that in the editing software, but I'm surprised to hear how much yeah. drift you have. It shouldn't be that yeah. much. So, the, so you don't know of any other ways to get it? It's just no, just edit it out. that's the only way I know. The, the worst in terms of drifting that I've seen was when using an iPhone because uh, the iPhones have uh, what's called variable frame rate. Depending on how much processing is going on, they may slow down the recording or, or speed it up again to the desired frame rate. And the editing software gets confused by that later because they expect 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second. Uh, so I've had a lot of synchronization issues recording with an iPro. The GoPros and my audio recorder um, and this Blackmagic recorder are uh, synced really, really well. And it requires a little bit of adjustment over a long video, but, but not too much from, okay. from what I've seen. Yes? On the outside cameras, what do you do for battery capacity? Do you just leave them on and just let them run out? And then yes. That's what you get? Yeah, I've, I've not found a way that I can attach power to it. So it's good for takeoff. If I want to do the landing, I, I got to make it a very short flight. Uh, you can connect it to your phone by Wi-Fi and just turn it off. Um, another way is, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, another I've way is the <laughs> extended battery. They make extended batteries they can put on concert GoPros. I have found that the uh, using the Wi-Fi in standby mode draws a lot of power also, and it, it's not a not a good help. Yes. The attenuator you use for audio is that a specific size attenuator or capacity? Uh, it is. Uh, in the interest of time, what I would suggest is go to YouTube and look for my video in-flight audio recording. It has the, the whole setup described in detail. Yes, sir. Does resolution or frame rate help with the, the jello and the vibration that is it sensitive? No, not, not from my experience. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the effect is still there. Um, if, if anything, if you go to 60 frames per second rather than 30, you, you limit the amount of exposure time that the camera has allowed, right? Because it needs to do everything twice as fast. So I, I think you'd um, make it harder rather than better. All right. Cool. So I think we have to give up the room for the next presentation. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.